We are back in the word and we moving on. Today we're going to be talking about the book of Jasher and we will be talking about Nimrod. Now I know, okay, that nobody knows who the original author of the book of Jasher was. Although it is mentioned in Joshua chapter 10 and in 2 Samuel chapter 1, Neither has the original manuscript survived. I know that, okay? So I want to talk about the book of Jasher that we do have. Published in November 1750, the title page of the book says, Translated into English by Flaccus Albinus Alcunus of Britain, Abbot of Canterbury, who went on a pilgrimage into the Holy Land in Persia, where he discovered this volume in the city of Gazna. The book claims to be written by Jasher, son of Caleb, one of Moses' lieutenants, who later judged Israel at Shiloh. The book covers biblical history from the creation down to Jasher's own day and was represented as the lost book of Jasher mentioned in the Bible. All right, now we're going to talk about Genesis chapter 10. All right, now this is the overview I have. The Christian Trinity had its origins in Nimrod. All right, in Genesis chapter 10, we are told that the start of Nimrod's kingdom began in three places. Babylon, Erech, and Akkad. All of these were in the land of Shinar. Now, all of these cities were located in a place called the land of Shinar. Okay? And today, that is modern-day Iraq in our times. All right? Furthermore, in Genesis chapter 11, we are told the following. It came about that as they traveled from the east, they found a plain in the land of Shinar and lived there. So the construction of the Tower of Babel was being spearheaded by Nimrod himself. Okay, now Nimrod, let's talk a little bit. Nimrod, because there is so much more to him than what meets the eye, Nimrod was born from Cush, who came from the cursed line of Ham. Nimrod took a lady named Ceramesis. Now, Ceramesis is not mentioned in the Bible, okay? This is actual history, okay? To be his wife, Ceramesis proclaimed herself to be the queen of heaven, after Nimrod died, his wife proclaimed him to be God. They had a son who was named Tammuz. Now, interesting. This is very interesting. Tammuz was considered to be the reincarnation of the God-man Nimrod. So we have Nimrod, who is God the Father, Ceramesis, the queen of heaven, who is considered to be the mother and the son who is considered to be the incarnation of the father. Now, doesn't this teaching strangely resemble something you may have learned in a Christian church? Can you see how the Christian teaching of the Trinity had its origins in Paganism, okay? Now, let me tell you something. Christianity did not destroy idolatry, okay, or paganism. Christianity adapted it, all right? Now, I want to talk about Nimrod and how he is a picture of the Apostle Paul. Nimrod and Paul have amazing similarities, all right. Now, I want to read in the book of Jasher, 
chapter 7, verse 27 through 29. And in their going out, Ham stole those garments. I'm going to pause right there because we got Israelite camps right now. <laughs> and black folk, we be stealing. Black folks be stealing. All right. If you thoroughly study the Bible, you will see that the kingdom has been taken from Israel and has been given to Ishmael. But what do you see? You see Israelites right now, so-called black, Hispanics, Native Americans going by Israelites. OK, and the black folks. OK, we just stole somebody else's garments. We just stole another man's religion. All right. And Israelites today, they hide behind the northern kingdom. They said God took the kingdom from Israel and gave it to the northern kingdom, which don't make no sense. But you don't see no northern kingdom leading this movement. It's all black folks stealing. OK, and I'm going to keep going where I started. And in their going, Ham stole those garments from Noah, his father, and he took them and hid them from his brothers. And when Ham begat his firstborn Cush, he gave the garments in secret and they were with Cush many Days Now, I can argue about the so-called Israelites, okay, who are actually saying they are Israelites, but this is the thing. Bruh, you don't even know if you're from Ham or if you're from Shem. Nobody has any paperwork there in Israelite, okay? The leader of the so-called biggest Israelite movement today could very well be a Hamite. You have no proof. You can't say, well, we are identified by the curses. Let me tell you something. Black people catch hell from the police, whether you are Ham, whether you are Japheth, and whether you are Sham. It doesn't matter if you're an American black or you are an African black. Your ass still going to catch hell from the police. So you don't even know if you're an Israelite and it don't even make no difference. OK, because it don't matter because the kingdom has been taken from Israel and has been given to a fruitful nation that will bring forth the fruits thereof. This is a nation that is speaking repentance, not blood sacrifice. OK, Christianity is based on another man's obedience. In Matthew 21, 43, Jesus was speaking of a nation that is going to bring forth fruit worthy of repentance. OK, and Islam is about repentance. There's no blood sacrifice. There's no lamb that's been slaughtered for your sins. OK, it is about repentance. Going back to where I was at, verse 29. And Cush also concealed them from his sons and brothers. And when Cush had begotten Nimrod, he gave him those garments through his love for him. And Nimrod grew up. And when he was 20 years old, he put on those garments. Now, remember, Paul, he was a wolf in sheep clothing. And here we have Nimrod putting on some stolen clothes according to the book of Jasher. OK, don't shoot me down. Don't shoot me down because I'm going through the book of Jasher. There is a lot to learn in here. All right. So I preach and I teach that Christianity is headed by Paul. The rabbi of the Christian church is not Jesus. It is Paul. If Jesus was the rabbi of the Christian church, Everybody would be selling everything they have and following the teachings of Jesus. There would be no poor people, okay? But the apostle Paul is the rabbi of the Christian church, okay? Now, this is seen in Jasher. I'm going to keep going. Verse 30 of chapter 7. And Nimrod became strong when he put on the garments and God gave him might and strength and he was a mighty hunter in the earth. Yea, 
He was a mighty hunter in the field. And he hunted the animals and built altars and offered them up on the altars before the Lord, okay? So when we think about Christianity, Christianity is built on sacrifice. It is all about sacrifice. And here we have Nimrod, okay? People are offering animals up, all right? Now, I'm going to show you something. I got a list of religious populations. Now, Christianity is 31 percent it is the largest religion in the world that's paul that is the house of saul okay now islam is 24.9 percent almost 30 percent okay christianity right now is the biggest religion christianity is the strongest religion on the planet Christianity is the Nimrod, okay? It's the best, okay? All religions cannot compare to Christianity because Christianity still has the belt. They are the biggest religion on the planet. So I'm going to read verse 31. And Nimrod strengthened himself, and he rose up from amongst his brethren, and he fought the battles of his brethren against all their enemies round about. That's Christianity today, okay? America, let me tell you something. America is Christian. I'm going to show you something. Don't you know, okay, almost all the presidents can be characterized as Christians, at least by upbringing, Though some were unaffiliated with any specific religious body, mainland Protestants predominant with Episcopalians and Presbyterians being the most prevalent. So most of the presidents, if not all, were all Christians. Joe Biden is a Catholic. Okay, the strongest. Religion in the world is Christianity. But let me tell you something. The house of Saul is getting weaker every day. You have two religions right now that are at odds with one another. You have the house of David, that is Islam, and you have the house of Saul, which is Paul, which is Christianity. All right. And let me tell you something. According to Google, if you look at it right now, Islam is the fastest growing religion on the planet. OK, the growth is faster than Christianity. Now, I want to talk about Nimrod. OK, and I want to keep going. I want to keep going. I want to go to the book of Jasher, chapter seven, verse 46, Nimrod made gods of wood and stone. And all the earth was of one tongue and words of union. But Nimrod did not go in the ways of the Lord. And he was more wicked than all the men that were before him from the days of the flood until those days. So let me tell you something. Christianity is nothing but paganism. Christianity is idolatry. Christianity is about worshiping the creature more than worshiping the creator. All right. Nimrod is a picture of Christianity. Notice it said gods of wood and stone. What's that? Churches. Churches. I'm going to tell you how many churches we have in the world. Right now, we have 37 million churches in the world and 45,000 denominations. Now, this is not counting Israelite camps and this is not counting house churches. All these churches everywhere, churches on every corner, and look at the crime rate today. No difference. No difference. And let me tell you something. Christianity has become so lazy 
There used to be a day when you would have at least 10 Christians knock on your door per year. Let me tell you something. Where I've been staying, I haven't had one Christian come and knock on my door and tell me about the good news in about four years, okay? Christianity has become a couch. It's become a big couch potato, okay? Especially because of electronics, okay? These phones and all these things keep them lazy, okay? So I want to show you how these gods of wood and stone is nothing more than the churches. Now, the Apostle Paul, how many churches did the Apostle Paul start? Some have said that Paul only started 14 churches in his lifetime. So, man, that, that's a remarkable thing, okay? 14 churches is a lot of churches. Now, if you study this, some people say he established seven churches, okay? And amazingly, in the book of Revelation, these same churches are the churches that Jesus addressed. <laughs> and he rebuked them, okay? And he talked about a false apostle. And he talked about them eating food sacrificed to idols. Amazingly, something that Paul teached, okay? He came to an agreement in Acts 15 that they are not supposed to eat food sacrificed to idols. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 8 and on, you'll see that he said that you can eat food sacrificed to idols because an idol is nothing, okay? So all these churches that I mentioned, 37 million worldwide, all those churches belong to Paul, okay? They belong to Paul, not Jesus. They're not following after Jesus they're following after Paul. Just think about John the Baptist. Think about John the Baptist. We had John the Baptist and we had Jesus. Jesus and John the Baptist did not follow each other. Jesus had his own thing going on and John the Baptist had his own thing going on. John the Baptist had followers and Jesus had followers. What happened? The house of John got weaker and weaker. And the house of Jesus got stronger and stronger. Okay, you got to pay attention. John the Baptist was a picture of the Apostle Paul. Even Jesus said that John was greater. Jesus didn't baptize John. John baptized Jesus. Jesus didn't start the ministry first. John the Baptist started the ministry first, okay? So these are two houses, the house of Saul and the house of David. Now, I want to get some scripture reference. This is going to be Acts chapter 14 and 23. This is the book of Acts chapter 14, verse 23. And when they had ordained them elders in every church and had prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord on whom they believed. Okay, so Paul ordained elders in every church. Now we have Titus chapter 1 verse 5. This is the book of Titus chapter 1 verse 5. For this cause left I thee in Crete, that thou shouldest set in order the things thou art wanting, and ordain elders in every city, as I had appointed thee. Paul said ordained elders in every city. Paul came on the scene and he took over. Okay, he pushed Peter out the way <laughs> and he pushed Jesus out the way. Okay, and Paul became the Jesus of the Christian church. Okay, we have many people that are opening up their eyes to this. We even have Christians today. Right now, you can look online. Christians who do not accept Paul as an apostle. All right. Amazingly, they still Christians. OK, they still off. They still blind. They don't realize, OK, that being a Christian is being a Paul follower. OK, so even Christians, OK, Muslims, of course. OK, they all do not receive Paul as an apostle. OK, but rather as the Antichrist. OK, so I want to show you how Christianity 
is this tower of Babel. It is this tower of confusion. Now, the word Babel actually means to confuse or confound. Think about this, y'all. Over 40,000 denominations that believe different and it's supposed to be one Holy Spirit. They are arguing with each other. Okay, we have some of the richest people in the world are Christians. When Jesus literally said, sell everything you have and come and follow me. Okay, so you're going to see that all this confusion, all this nonsense, all this stuff is nothing but babble. Okay, the Christians don't even have one scripture coming from God Almighty in his own words saying that Jesus died for your sins. The Christians don't have one word coming from God Almighty when he says Jesus is God. Now we have scriptures of God saying Moses is a God to Pharaoh and Moses is a God to Aaron and Joshua is a servant, a minister. We have nothing of Joshua being a God, okay? God even made Joshua tell that son to be still. What is that son? Christianity. There's a day coming when all that sun worship, all that paganism is going to stop. In the house of David, we are here and we are setting up God's kingdom on earth. We are the answer to Jesus' prayer when he says, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We are the kingdom of God set up on earth. Now, I want to keep going. I want to go to the book of Jasher, chapter 8. And we're going to learn about this son that was born to the house of Terah, okay? And we're going to learn about this son that was born in the house of Mary. This is going to be Jasher, chapter 8, verse 9. We heard that a son was born to Terah the son of Naor, the prince of thy host. And we yesternight came to his house and we ate and drank and rejoiced with him that night. And when thy servants went out from the house of Terah to go to our respective homes to abide there for the night, we lifted up our eyes to heaven and we saw a great star coming from the east. Ooh, that sounds familiar, don't it? A great star coming from the east. And the same star ran with great speed and swallowed up four great stars from the four sides of the heavens. And thy servants were astonished at the sight which we saw and were greatly terrified. And we made our judgment upon the sight. And we knew by our wisdom the proper interpretation thereof. That this thing applies to the child that is born to Terah. Who will grow up and multiply greatly and become powerful. And kill all the kings of the earth and inherit all their lands. He and his seed forever. And now, our Lord and King, behold, we have truly acquainted thee with what we have seen concerning this child. If it seem of good to the king to give his father value for this child, we will slay him before he shall grow up and increase in the land and his evil increase against us that we and our children perish through his evil. And the king heard their words, and they seemed good in his sight, and he sent and called for Terah. And Terah came before the king. And the king said to Terah, I have been told that a son was yesternight born to thee, and after this manner was observed, in the heavens at his birth. And now, therefore, give me the child, 
that we may slay him before his evil springs up against us. And I will give thee for his value thy house full of silver and gold. Now, pay attention to Terah because he actually used some wisdom in how he answered. Okay. Verse 17. And Terah answered the king and said to him, my Lord and king, I have heard thy words and thy servant shall do all that his king desireth. But my Lord and King, I will tell thee what happened to me yesternight, that I may see what advice the king will give his servant. And then I will answer the king upon what he has just spoken. And the king said, speak. And Terah said to the king, Aon, son of Morak, came to me yesternight, saying, Give unto me the great and beautiful horse that the king gave thee, and I will give thee silver and gold and straw and provender for its value. And I said to him, Wait till I see the king concerning thy words, and behold, whatever the king saith, that will I do. And now, my lord and king, behold, I have made this thing known to thee, and the advice which my king will give unto his servant, that will I follow. So he played him, y'all. He played him. Peep game. Verse 22. And the king heard the words of terror, and his anger was kindled, and he considered him in the light of a fool. And the king answered terror, and he said to him, Art thou so silly, ignorant, or deficient in understanding? To do this thing, to give thy beautiful horse for silver and gold or even for straw and provender? Art thou so short of silver and gold that thou shouldest do this thing? Because thou canst not obtain straw and provender to feed thy horse? And what is silver and gold to you or straw and provender? That thou shouldest give away that fine horse which I gave thee like which there is none to be had on the whole earth. <laughs> and the king left off speaking, and Terah answered the king, saying, Like unto this has the king spoken to his servant, I beseech thee, my lord and king, what is this which thou didst say unto me, saying, Give thy son that we may slay him. And I will give thee silver and gold for his value. What shall I do with this silver and gold after the death of my son? Who shall inherit me? Surely then at my death, the silver and gold will return to my king who gave it. So he played him. He was like, yeah, look at you. You getting all mad at me about giving up my horse. But here you is asking for my son to kill him. And we know that a man is more value than that of a horse, okay? So what we're going to do is we're going to come back to that. We're going to come back to this. I also, I want to go to the story of Jesus, okay? So we can see how his birth was similar to that of Abraham. Also, even Moses. Okay, they were seeking to kill Moses too, the son of the Torah. <laughs> so now I want to go to Matthew chapter 2, verse 1. And now, now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and are come to worship him. See, you see this same thing with Abraham, this star. All right. Although it don't go into detail like in Jasher. Verse three, when Herod, the king had heard these things, he was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. 
And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he demanded of them where Christ should be born. And they said unto him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet, And thou, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not the least among the princes of Judah, for out of thee shall come a king, no, a governor, that shall rule my people Israel. Then Herod, when he had privily called the wise men, inquired of them diligently what time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search diligently for the young child, and when you have found him, bring me word again that I may come and worship him also. When they had heard the king, they departed, and lo, the star, which they saw in the east, went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. And when they were coming to the house, they saw the young child with Mary, his mother, and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him gifts, gold, and frankincense, and myrrh. So remember, okay, they offer Abraham's father riches, gold. Okay, and we have this same thing. So, man, we're going to be picking back up. We're going to be picking back up. I am going to go, matter of fact, on how Abraham was saved. Yeah, we finna find out how Abraham was saved. All right, so now I want to go back to Jasher. This is going to be Jasher chapter 8. And this is going to be verse 27. Picking back up where we left off at. Verse 27. And when the king heard the words of terror and the parable which he brought concerning the king, it grieved him greatly and he was vexed at this thing and his anger burned within him because it made him look like a straight up hypocrite. All right. But nevertheless, let's see what Terah has to say. And Terah saw that the anger of the king was kindled against him. And he answered the king saying, all that I have is in the king's power. Whatever the king desired to do to his servant, that let him do. Yea, even my son, he is in the king's power without value in exchange he and his two brothers that are older than he. And the king said to Terah, no, but I will purchase thy younger son for a price. So he was trying to give the king his son for free. But he's like, no, I'm going to pay for it because I told you, I just showed you how money go was involved with Jesus. And it's the same thing with Abraham. Verse 30. And Terah answered the king, saying, I beseech thee, my lord and king, to let thy servant speak a word before thee, and let the king hear the word of his servant. And Terah said, Let my king give me three days. Uh Uh-oh. How come these three days is affiliated with this son? Just like the three days of Jesus' so-called rising is affiliated with Jesus. Let my king give me three days, time till I consider this matter within myself and consult with my family concerning the words of my king. And he pressed the king greatly to agree to this. He's just like, man, please, let me go talk to my wife. Let me, let me go talk to my family, man. I'm about to, I'm about to give you my son. So that, you know, you're going to find out that the king consented and the king hearkened to Terah and he did so and gave him three days time And Terah went out from the king's presence and he came home to his family and spoke to them all the words of the king. And the people were greatly afraid. And it was in the third day that the king sent to Terah saying, send me thy son for a price as I spoke to thee. And shouldest thou not do this, I will sin and slay all that thou hast in thy house so that thou shalt not even have a dog remaining. 
and Tara hastened as the thing was urgent from the king. Now watch this, y'all. Watch how Abraham was saved. And he took a child from one of his servants. Uh-oh, that man had wisdom. He's like, uh-uh, I ain't gonna give you my son. I'm about to give you one of my servant's sons. Woo! Which his handmaid had born to him that day. And Torah brought the child to the king and received value for him. And the Lord was with Terah in this matter. So the Lord was guiding this idol worshiper. He was guiding Abraham's father only because of his son, Abraham. All right. And the Lord was with Terah in this matter that Nimrod might not cause Abraham's death. <laughs> Just like the apostle Paul. He wanted to kill Jesus, but he couldn't. God took him alive, and we're going to come back to that. And the king took the child from Terah, and with all his might dashed his head to the ground, for he thought he had been Abram. And this was concealed from him that day, and it was forgotten by the king as it was the will of the providence not to suffer Abraham's death. There were angels on assignment to keep Abraham alive. And I tell you today, there was angels assigned on Isa, Jesus, to keep him alive. Okay. Now, I want to keep going. And Terah took Abram, his son, secretly together with his mother and nurse, and he concealed them in a cave. <laughs> and the truth about what really happened to Jesus came from a man who had a visitation with an angel in the cave. He told us that God saved him and that he was neither crucified or killed. And the Lord was with Abram in the cave and he grew up and Abram was in the cave 10 years y'all and the king and his princes soothsayers and sages thought that the king had killed Abraham to this day how many people on planet earth believe that Jesus is crucified okay and they forgot all about the matter they forgot all about what the prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, told us. He told us that God saved him a lot. OK, so now we're going to be going over how Jesus was saved. OK, we're going to be talking about Simon the Cyrene and we're going to be bringing up even Judas. OK, I'm going to give you a quick summary of what we're going to go into next. Now, according to the gospel of Basilites, okay? Simon the Cyrene was killed in Jesus' place, okay? Not Jesus. And this answers the confusion we have about who carried Jesus' cross. And the gospel of John tells us that Jesus carried his own cross. But in the other gospels, it says Simon the Cyrene carried it. Also, in the gospel of Barnabas, it tells us how Jesus was saved, okay, by the angels and went into heaven alive. And Judas was killed in Jesus' place. That God allowed Judas to be changed into Jesus. And that he was killed in Jesus' place. So just like the kid goat was killed in Joseph's place and Joseph was alive, just like the ram was killed in Isaac's place and Isaac was alive. I'm going to miss this. We're going to be picking back up on this topic. I encourage you to wake the hell up, okay? Stop being a fool. Your God is not the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Your God is Paul. You've been deceived by the wolf in sheep clothing. Now it's time for us to do what we do and get any scripts. Y'all ready? Yes. <laughs> 